In 2 Timothy 4.2, the Apostle Paul exhorts Timothy to preach the word. And since the Reformation, Protestants have held up preaching as one of the key marks of the church. And for centuries, Christians have listened to sermons on Sunday mornings, week in and week out. And yet, despite how familiar the sermon is to us today, it nevertheless is often misunderstood. In today's interview, I'm sitting down with Doug O'Donnell to talk through common questions that lay people and pastors alike have about preaching and what makes for a good sermon. Doug has been preaching from God's Word for decades, has served in local church ministry, and currently works as the Senior Vice President of Bible Editorial at Crossway. He's also the author of a number of books and commentaries, including The Beauty and Power of Biblical Exposition, Preaching the Literary Artistry and Genres of the Bible, which he co-authored with Leland Riken. Let's get started. Well, Doug, thank you for joining me today on the Crossway Podcast. It's great to be with you, Matt. Thanks for inviting me. So today we're going to talk about preaching and sermons and all that is entailed within that. Do you remember your first sermon? I do. It depends what you th- you say my first sermon was. So I, I was converted when I was 19, and then the first time I ever gave, I wouldn't call it a sermon, but public testimony, mm. was I was working at Wheaton College. I was about to be a student at Wheaton College in the physical plant, and I had told one of the workers my testimony. He said, you need to share in chapel next week. So I shared in chapel. The interesting thing, so that was just my testimony, how I became a Christian, mm. but it was my first time speaking publicly about the things of God. Yeah. And I knew, not just from that, but a, a sense of calling, like, oh, I think I'm good at this. Mm. Um, and my wife was actually in the audience four years younger than me. She was in high school. She was working for the physical plant as well. So we wouldn't meet till years after. Oh, she wow. remembered me. She remembered you, though. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so that, that's another interesting thing. But th- this question is really um, intriguing because <laughs> my... When I, my first sermon as a pastor... Yeah, let's talk about in it, the context of like a church. Yeah, is super memorable. memorable. And I actually write about in the, the book that's coming out with Crossway. Um, it was the Sunday after 9-11. Wow. Um, and... Were you the pastor of this church? I was associate pastor. So this was a church plant from College Church called Christ the King. Uh, Ken Carr was the senior pastor. What we decided to do, if my memory serves me correctly, was... Ken preached the first week, opening Sunday of the church, um, you know, early September, on the Incarnation. I I believe it was Philippians 2. Mm. Then I was tasked with preaching on Revelation 19, which is the second coming of Christ. And so I was a bit nervous going into it, like, will people want to read about birds eating, you know, the flesh of kings and all these (laughs) these sort of graphic (laughs) images? But after 9-11, it was so providential that this was the passage that I got to preach on the first time as a pastor wow. was the coming judgment of Christ. And I, I was riveted at the text, and I think people were as well. So a very, <laughs> a very wow. memorable uh, first sermon as a pastor, for sure. Do you remember, like, as you were preparing to preach for that Sunday and then 9-11 happens, you know, did you have to make changes to the sermon? Did you kind of go back to the drawing board to some extent, or were you able to kind of preach it like you had planned? Yeah, I I definitely added um, a long sort of pre-introduction before I read the text, you know, aware of, and I'm sure throughout the service we had prayed and acknowledged it in some way. Um, But I shared a longer version of what I just shared, like in God's providence, I was a bit like concerned, like, oh, this is our pastor. This is the text he picked for the first time he's going to preach, Revelation 19, who does that? Um, and it's so graphic in its mm. imagery and, it, and the violence that it's sort of depicting of the judgment. Um, but how in God's providence, mm. I think this is exactly the word we need to hear today as God's people, as a country. Um, you know, Christ is coming and going to make everything right in his time. And so I something like that. And then, and then I didn't have to change so much. Of the, I probably weaved in different aspects of yeah. what had happened that week. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but no, I think that the meat of the sermon didn't mm. didn't change. <laughs> so do you do you remember feeling nervous? I mean, I would just imagine that your first sermon in, in front of your new church, uh, the second sermon the church has ever heard on a difficult book of the Bible, yeah. and then on top of all of that, coming off of this national tragedy like we had not experienced for 
you know, probably since Pearl Harbor. Right. So, uh, do you remember what you felt going into that sermon? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think, um, somewhat, I feel like my early preaching, I was somewhat oblivious to nerves. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why. Actually, later in life, I got more nervous oh, different interesting. times. Oh, um, interesting. Do you know, have any theories as to why that might be? Uh, I think, like, the setting, um, is is one thing so i'm this is be throughout my life like i'm very comfortable if oh this is my church i know these people um if i go into i'm i'm very comfortable preaching at a church so like if someone has me preach at you know an outdoor venue mm. you know some summer fest thing where i'm like i know people aren't here to really hear, hear the bible i yeah. get a little more nervous because i'm like i have to I'm I'm the show. It feels like, yeah. you know, Whereas a worship serv- service, there's a lot of other elements, and we're all here to worship God. We're all yeah. here to listen to the Word. So I think, and, and maybe just youth and overconfidence, <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. f- feeling like I got this. You yeah, know, um, you thought you were better than yeah, you yeah. Do now even <laughs> exactly right. Huh. You should have heard me back then. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think I was I was also confident in like God's gifting to me, mm. and that like this is what I should be doing. I'm excited to be. So maybe it doing wasn't this. all youthful overconfidence. No, well, right, a mix, I think. Yeah. And then I think I was, uh, I was also confident in the text. Like this mm-hmm. is what we need to hear, and so that made me. Uh, I don't remember being, you know, anxious mm. uh, about it. Um, How big a part is that in terms of uh, feeling prepared and feeling confident in your preaching? Is like this settled confidence in the text itself and in the message mm. of the text itself being appropriate, being true, being good for the people. Have you ever struggled with that at times? Maybe certain passages where you've just felt, oh, I don't know how this is going to go over, I, and not my sermon necessarily, but yeah. the actual truth of the Bible here. Has that ever been a, an issue for you? Yeah, for sure. There are certain passages I I, I know coming to, uh, okay, this is going to be, um, this is going to, be prophetic to this congregation mm-hmm. or at this moment in history or something like this. And this could, you know, go over well or not go over well. Um, and so that, that then, you know, I might have some sort of consternation about how is this going to go. Mm-hmm. And usually when, when you're then preaching it, you, you can feel, you get a sense of like how, how it is going over. And there've been times when I feel like, okay, I'm a little too strong here mm-hmm. or I was too strong, which I didn't say that. Um, and yet, so it's mostly like texts that I feel uh, where like the author or Jesus, you know, the prophet or Jesus, whoever is is being, like the end of the Sermon on the Mount is just like, you're, you stand before me on Judgment Day and some of you will say, Lord, Lord, you know, and I'll say, depart from me. Those are hard hitting mm. texts. And I I think part of good preaching is like leaving leaving the tension in the air. Um, yeah. And like Jesus did, that's how he decided to end the sermon. Not trying to like um, console the listener. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you want to present the gospel at some point, but not always at the end. Mm. Um, and especially, you know, I preached once the opening of Nahum, which I don't remember very well. All I know, it's a lot of judgment. Like it's all judgment. Mm. And uh, I wanted that to be the, I knew it was going to be hard for people to hear. Um, so I wanted it to, to be easy enough to hear you know, how, how can I make it easy enough? And then also, um, how do I not, not take the feel of the text out of it, you know, by, by, yeah. by, you know, making, making light of it or, or making, um, you know, I never preach like this or, or something like letting the, yeah. letting the weight land on the congregation. But that's always dangerous because people aren't used to that. Yeah. Um, and you know, even last week I, or Sunday, two days ago, I was preaching and, it, it was a heavy passage and my wife was with me and my family was with me. Someone came up to her right afterwards and just was like, oh, so great to see you guys, you know, like in the normal things. <laughs> and she was like, did you not, mm-hmm. did you not listen like to what was yeah. just said? Like we just all need to kind of pause. <laughs> uh, and I, I, that's how, so I think some people react to that kind of text and preaching. Like they don't know what to do. So they're like, Hey, how's it going? What are you guys doing for the fourth? You know, other people, I've uh, when I've preached things like that, I've often said I don't want to talk to people afterwards. Mm. Like I just want to go in a room. <laughs> yeah, because I want it to l- to land on people and for them to think this is this is some serious stuff that we don't normally think about that we 
we should think about. I've wondered about that because I've I've uh, done a little bit of preaching myself, but I've also uh, done far more listening to sermons. Right. And it's funny how there can be a little bit of this dynamic of you sit down to listen to the sermon, you're engaged, I'm paying attention, I'm thinking about it. But as soon as that maybe final song is sung, there's a kind of a switch that yeah. flips and it's like, all right, now we're in uh, what to do for lunch mode. Right. And we're now talking about our week, kind of small talk again. Uh, have, how have you sought as a pastor to kind of extend the impact of that sermon beyond mm. just that 45 minute window? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I've had much success <laughs> with it. I, there have time to time, I'll say, um, you know, maybe as a family talk, ask, answer this question on mm. the way home. Uh, what was surprising or w- what, what really engaged you? When were mm. you most engaged? Um, uh, or when did you feel God's presence? during the service or during the sermon and why do you think that was the case you know so but it is hard right after the service i maybe occasionally like once or twice um uh, that same sort of thing to the congregation like i want you to walk out of here and turn to the, turn to somebody and and talk about this mm. don't talk about the bears game that's you know coming up or, yeah, or whatever right whatever else and th- there obviously is a, a time for for small talk and for just fellowship in the sense of like We're just going to talk about our lives and what we are doing this weekend or uh, the holidays Mm. or where vacation you're going on. Um, So it's a real it's a real challenge because I do think we're not trained as a congregation to, uh, you know, how do we process certain sermons um, in a way that's really healthy for us. So this relates to maybe an age old question slash debate that Christians in, in particular kind of the pastor types have had for for decades now. And that's uh the question of what to prioritize in our preaching. Should it be expository through books of the Bible or is there uh is it better to be more topical or have topical series of some sort where you're engaging different issues as they're relevant? Mm-hmm. Um how do you think about that question? I think there's often these hard and fast battle lines drawn a little bit and at least in our camps sometimes. Yeah. Uh, what would be your approach, your recommendation to a pastor trying to discern how to think about that? Yeah, uh, part of it is my own mentoring and what school I sort of, you know, schooled in the sense of school of preaching uh, informally. But, you know, College Church, Kent Hughes was my biggest influence. And so that was serial exposition. That is going through a book of the Bible verse by verse for the most time, most of the time. And then... Um, yeah, the whole book, so the whole of Genesis or the whole of a small book like Colossians and maybe breaks in between uh, with with different things. If it was a large book, like uh, I preached through like Matthew in an almost 90 sermons and wow. I did it in four years, so that's that's breaking it up a little bit yeah. uh, or a lot. You, you had know? little mini-series Yeah, so those? I think I did like um, Psalms in the summer, you know, something yeah. like that. So something that fits, like, if people are on vacation, they're not, like, missing a series. It's yeah. like, they're all one-offs, but they're all from the Psalms. Yeah. Um, so, and I would I would mix it up with a different, different genre, so not, you know, Gospel of Mark <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something like that. So, and typically Old Testament. Because that's some of the critique, perhaps, of the straight through a book of the Bible, week after week, you know, verse after verse, is that, you might get bogged down in one yeah. particular book or section of scripture and you're you're not really getting exposed to the breadth of what scripture has for us on the one hand on the other hand there another critique could be that you know the church might be facing something specific right now or right. culturally there's something specific going on and it'd be important to address that from the bible let god's work speak to that issue right. So how do you balance that with then the benefits of going through a book of the Bible and teaching the yeah, kind of context? I, I think um, there are certain things that happen, like 9-11 would be a good example. Like if I wasn't preaching on <laughs> Revelation 19, I would have I would have picked something. Mm. that, But I wouldn't have done a topical sermon on Islam or something yeah. like that. I, I would have, part, I mean, a number of reasons. One, I'm not an expert. You know, two, I don't. I don't know if I trust myself like picking all the right topics. Yeah. Um, those two things combined are, you know, are, it's hard to be, you know, in our culture, like critical race is a big theory is a big mm-hmm. thing. Well, I don't, I don't have enough knowledge. And, yeah. and to be honest, I don't think I have enough time or desire to read all the right books and then write a sermon on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what text am I going to go to in the Bible? All these sort of things. So it's not that it's a, it's an important issue. It's just, you know, or abortion, obviously with Roe Ro versus Wade, 
um, that might be one that, you know, would be so historic that I'm mm-hmm. going to do a, a one-off on abortion and maybe child sacrifice in the Old Testament. Like, that would be more than appropriate. I would always go to a specific text and walk through it um, rather than a more systematic hmm. um, approach. That's just me, but I, I'm not opposed to, like, someone doing... Here's, like a survey here's, of all the passages. Here's what, yeah, the Bible says on the theme of, you know feeding the poor or something like that Mm -hmm. um, and go all over the place and show. But I would rather, you know, go to a a certain passage and, and kind of walk through it. Yeah. And then maybe jump other places to support what that passage is saying. Because I think you, you look at some of the, the sermons that we see in the new Testament, whether it was Jesus himself or other apostles, and they do often have, you know, there's a little, there's lots of differences to to how they're doing stuff, but uh, they do often pull on multiple old Testament passages to kind of make a, a coherent point. Yep. Um, so you think that's a valid way to do it at times? I, I think at times, again, I actually think there's a, a, a larger time commitment to do that and to do it really well. Um, whereas if you just have, a, I'm doing this passage, next week I'm doing this passage, yeah. and you're in the same book and you, you know, oh, you're getting to learn, oh, this book is about this. Hmm. I will say, though, I, I am, um, I think there are certain, like the Gospels, I think you we should be preaching through them a lot. Um, Mm. I think they are so suitable for like Sunday morning service. And this is why historically, both in the East and the West, liturgically, the gospel reading is the last reading before the pastor gets up and, and preaches something. And so the gospels work really well. Um, Something like the longer prophets like Isaiah, those are really hard to preach through and I've never done it. Um, And they're intimidating for a number of reasons, but but one of them is just the repetition of mercy and judgment and over and over yeah. and over again. Now, there's a lot of beautiful poetry, a lot of interesting things happening. Uh, but you have to know the history. You have to know what's going on. And you have to be able to, how do I sustain a congregation for 66 plus weeks mm. um, on these repetitive sort of themes that are hugely important? Yeah. Um, and Isaiah is hugely important in the New Testament. Um, but I don't think it's suited as well. Um, as the Gospels and even some of the shorter epistles. Um, but then I, I've done a lot of work on the Song of Songs, and I actually think like there are different places where we should use, and I've preached through the Song of Songs, but I also feel like why don't we just use it what it's intended for, like a wedding song, like use it at weddings all the time, write mm. music to it, sing it. Um, and then that's when, we, that's when we use the Song of Songs most naturally. The same with Paul's letters. I often feel devotionally they should be like what we read all the time. Yeah, And then also... Uh, he says, "Read them aloud in the churches. Like let's let's read the whole thing aloud. Like that that would be a good use of that. Now that's not to say you can't preach on Paul, obviously. <laughs> that, that's but, such a helpful nuance too, because you know we would affirm that all Scripture is God breathed, all of it is useful for us and given to us for our good. But that doesn't mean there might not be certain uses for different parts of the Bible that might be more natural to them than other parts. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's what I've learned over the years. I just feel like when I'm preaching, I've preached through all of Mark, all of Matthew. I don't think people get bored mm. with Jesus, and the Gospels have so, they have almost every every genre in them, and so the Lord's Prayer is poetry, uh, all of that discourse is apocalyptic <laughs> literature, mm. you know. So you're you're jumping different places, yeah, um, and at different genres, and that I think that helps people. But if you're doing just prophetic literature, sixty six weeks in a row, um, it that's hard. That's hard to preach. Um, no, I'm not saying you can't, and yeah. I know people who have. Um, but yeah, I it, just think that there there are certain certain books that are easier for the preacher to get into and easier for the congregation to listen to. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe a few quick questions here. Yeah. How long is the ideal sermon? <laughs> yeah, I I've I think 35 is what I do, and I I think that I do that because I think it's ideal. Um, I am. Doing Crossway Chapel, where I've got to, the sermon's got to be 20 to 25. It's been a really good challenge, and I think I've learned through that. And when I lived in Australia, I had to do, they d- typically do shorter sermons. Um, Such as a cultural difference? It's a cultural thing, yeah. Um, and, and and they they advocate for it, too. Like, it make you know, your sermon should be 25 minutes, something like that. Mm. Um, and not across the board, but a lot of preachers would do that. And... I actually found that helpful, like to, it's kind of goes back to the editing thing. Like 
I actually think, you know, by shortening this, it improves the sermon. Not always. Um, but I, I do think especially for, I can listen to like a 55-minute sermon if it's like Sinclair Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> there are very few people, though, that I would listen to and uh, think it's good, a 55. You, uh, that um, you would think you needed 55 I need, minutes. Yeah, I need it. And I think especially with my editor hat on, um, I'm like you. You didn't need that illustration. You didn't need. You didn't need that. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you you spent way too much time exegeting, way too much information, which is my problem a lot. And so, I often like I got to get the information quick. You know, get through that quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means editing words. And I often find when I have to edit the exegetical information, and and say it in one sentence instead of three paragraphs, it's going to be much better. Mm. Um, and so. I think there are preachers who just like to hear themselves talk and, or they're good storytellers. And so they can kind of go on and on about things and, and then their congregation might get used to it. They might think it's great. And then that's wonderful. Then go ahead. 55 minutes. Um, (laughs) But I, I have for younger preachers, I always say, you know, shoot for 20, 25 minutes. You'll probably go longer because you think you have to say this, you know? Yeah. Uh, But I've learned over time, I don't have to have to say everything, and if if I'm pastoring a congregation, I have I have a lot of time to say that um, another time, um, mm. and so I can use that illustration another time, or I can um, talk about that theme I really want to talk more about when this passage comes up because I know it's coming up in a few few weeks. Yeah, it's not a one and done kind of thing. When right, you're the pastor of a church. Do you preach from notes or a manuscript or from memory? Yeah, when I, I preach from notes, uh, or sorry, I preach from a manuscript, but I, I have tried all three when I was in college, and uh, part of it had to do with Kent Hughes, who's a manuscript preacher, and really learning from him, not learning from him sitting down with me showing how to write a manuscript, but just I've looked at his manuscripts, I've seen him preach on a manuscript, and I, so there's part of that is like, that was just my training, mm. uh, imitation more than anything, but then... As I, in college, tried, okay, I'm going to get up and do this with just my Bible open, um, I felt it was very freeing, um, but I felt like two things. One, I wasn't accurate, as accurate as I wanted to be. Yeah. And then second, I I wasn't sort of uh, myself in that I love wordsmithing, and I love, I could memorize some of the lines I might want to have, but not all of them. And for me, and this is as a writer too, it's like every line's gold. That's how I'm feeling. You know, like every <laughs> line's got to be. And even like this, I'm giving information about this. If I'm not happy with the sentence, then, uh, you know, then it needs to be edited. And so the, I'm the same way with sermons. Like I want every sentence that there's cadence to it. There's that's a long sentence. Here's a short sentence. Or here's like word, word, word. Then I'm going into this. Here's um, alliteration, mm. you know, sort of subtly lining the sentence. And, um, and it's much harder to do that. It's much harder. You moment. have to have a, a brilliant memory um, mm. to do that. So what I do is I've just become a better manuscript preacher, or hopefully better <laughs> manuscript preacher. When I was young and preaching at college church, um, I had someone come up to me after every sermon any another good rebuke that I constantly think about and it was eyes up that's all he'd say eyes up he'd say that to you every sermon yeah almost every sermon. oh boy like early on and then I would get <laughs> I got my eyes up more and more as yeah. time went on but I learned over time I can't get my eyes up if I don't know what's on the sheet of paper in front of me and so the more I can get the sermon in my head the better and again I don't memorize anything but what I do is I through the editing process, I'm getting very familiar with my manuscript. Then, once I've got it polished, and I'm always repolishing as I go, there's always little marks. You know, by the time I get up to preach, there's always little squiggles here and there, like that I've changed things. Um, but I remember those because I just squiggled it that morning. Um, so I'm just, I'm like, I know when I get to this page what it's about. I know what this is, and I know the flow of the sermon. And so I, it wouldn't be like if you if you took the manuscript away from me, I would, you know, know exactly what I want to do. But I'd be able to finish the sermon. I mm, think, yeah, <laughs> not as well as I like. But yeah, um, and then I think um, I also more and more the older I've gotten is I, I've done certain things um, like memorize certain phrases or sections to make sure my eyes are up when I say that. 
because I know it could be more powerful if I'm actually looking at people when I say that. And the other thing is I record myself preaching the sermon just on my phone, and then I will listen to it um, as a, like, yesterday I preached, or Sunday I preached as I'm driving to that church. And what I'm doing right is... Right before the sermon. Right before the sermon. This is a new thing I do. What I'm doing is that I'm like, I'm, it's, a, it's another thing. So I'm, I've been looking at it, my eyes, but my ears have not heard me preach it. Mm. And so to hear, like, it just helps with my memory a ton. And I do the same thing. I will always, I will always Sunday morning read the sermon kind of quickly, but with the, with the sense of like memorize as much as you can. And then I will say it aloud. I'll go into a room upstairs and I'll just, I will preach it like exactly like I'm going to preach it where I want to pause sometimes with gestures. Um, and then that helps me get it. Take a full I'm, dress I'm rehearsal. Yeah, like a full dress rehearsal. Um, and then I'm listening to it in the car now and I find those those steps really yeah. help me get it in my head. So it's amazing to hear you say all this, both the amount of time that you spend preparing to preach and then the intentionality with the words that you're using, how you're crafting each sentence, and then all that preparation work, the practice that you're doing to try to internalize it, even though you do have a manuscript, um, all the way up to the, the morning before you preach yeah. it. I think I've again I've heard Maybe you I'm preach. Maybe I'm abnormal. <laughs> no, I mean I've heard you preach a number of times, and and you do strike me as I, I think of you as a an experienced, um, effective preacher. And I think sometimes the assumption can be when someone's been doing it for a long time, and is good at it, naturally gifted towards it. Well, it, it should be at some point become pretty easy. You uh -huh. don't really have to work that hard <laughs> right. at doing it. What what is it? Um, do you think that's true? Is that the right way to think about this? Or is that yeah. is that like the path to bad preaching? It, it could be the path to bad preaching. That's my gut instinct. But I, I, I'm sure I can be proven wrong. I think um, there is... I mentioned earlier Sinclair Ferguson. I'm going to guess Sinclair Ferguson's pretty good on his toes. Um, I don't know. And I, I don't know him personally. But I think there are certain people who you could just say, open this passage and... They've never seen it. They don't know what passage, and and you just say, "Can you preach on it?" And they would, they would do okay. I get a sense like someone like Charles Spurgeon's like that, but I don't. But the thing like Spurgeon, his stuff is so carefully crafted too, and mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if he did that off the top of his head, and that's amazing. Um, but for, sort of literary value to his sermons is incredible. But that said, there are people out there who can do that mm. pretty well, and I don't think they're cheating anybody, obviously, because we think it's it's brilliant. Um, and God has gifted them. Um, I think it isn't sort of knowing yourself, and so I'm I'm a bit of a prepare freak for everything. Um, <laughs> I don't think I could not do that. But what I've gotten better at is just, um, hey, you know, I've got to, I can't, I'm going into this thing, and I, I don't have all the parachutes I want. Um, that's okay. Like, just do it. Like even this interview, you know, just like mm. <laughs> you said as I walked in, oh, good, you have no notes with you, you know, and, <laughs> and there was no like what half an hour prep time, you know, like, no. um, and so, and that just jump into uh, it and just jump into it. And I'm like, it was a part of it is like, trust yourself. Like you can talk about preaching for an hour and you'll mm. do just fine. Um, and so the same with preaching, like I can trust myself more the older I get. Yeah. Uh, and yet I have habits and those are good habits in my mind. If I was in a, well, what I'm in now is, you know, day job, okay, crossway stuff, and then you got to preach in chapel. Um, now, part of the sermon I'll work on crossway time, since it's for crossway. Um, but I remember Josh Dennis, our president, saying, you know, how much time did it take you to, to I had redone a sermon um, and shortened it for crossway and changed it, and I said it took me 10 hours. And he was like, what, 10 hours? You know, like, um, and I, I thought, oh, that was kind of short, you know, for, <laughs> but it was a, it was a redo. Um, but I, I do think, I don't know if I could get out of those good habits, but I could, I think if I was, if I was forced to, uh, you know, I had to work as a mailman and then I, I was the only guy in town who could, who could open God's word and mm. be, be effective somewhat. I could do that, you know, yeah. and it would be a good challenge probably. Yeah. You have um, to kind of adjust to what you have. Yeah. Available. And I've often thought like if, there is, um, you know, a preacher gets sick or faints or something. Like, I would hope I'd be able to get up and just open my Bible mm. and teach something, 
you know, that yeah. would, would be coherent. Yeah. <laughs> and let me just share this too. I do think there's a, um, I think this was from my friend. Oh, was he, it was either Josh Moody or Doug Sweeney. So Edwards scholars, but, um, they had shared with me Edwards, John Edwards, early manuscripts. They're all meticulously written out. And then I hope I'm getting this right. <laughs> and then at the end, he'll, he'll, as he gets older, he just would write like, talk about the new birth squiggle. Um, <laughs> and so he knew that topic so well. Yeah. He knew what he would That's say. It's a lifetime it. of, of um, study. Yeah. And so like, I think I could do that. I don't do it, but I think I could do it. Mm. Um, you know, talk about, uh, like there are certain stories in scripture, like talk about the young rich ruler. Well, I just, I, I can, I probably have it memorized like, or very closely paraphrased. Yeah. Like, and I could tell you exactly what's happening there. So um, I, there are things like that where I'm confident enough that, okay, I could, yeah, I could just swing it and I'll just, be fine. Just go right in. <laughs> What would what would you say is something that you want to do in every sermon that you preach? And then I want to ask the opposite of that. What's something that you never want to do in any sermon that you preach? Yeah. What I want to do is I would love I would love to cover everything. Um, so Brian Chappell's got a great definition of expository preaching. I, I don't have it memorized, but it, it's something to the extent of like, you know, everything you've you've read. Uh, let's say for the scripture reading, like. And you sort of promised to preach on. Yeah, it's actually. Going, oh, there's nothing more covered. frustrating than, <laughs> you know, a, let's read our passage for this morning, and that's read, and then you know, there's like three verses at the end, maybe the most interesting verses, yes. the most tricky verses, and then they just disappear. It's exactly like, right. It's like <laughs> there's no mention of them whatsoever. Yeah. So what I what I would what I do is if I'm like especially doing a longer section of scripture, it's just try to be honest with the congregation is, and I've, I learned this from David Jones, an Australian, well, he's a Welshman who preached in Australia, and I sat under his preaching for three years. He he would say, kind of in Puritan style, like, my text for today is verse 17. So he the, the reading was longer, and he's going to cover the reading, but he's going to do it through the lens of what he sees as the key verse. Mm-hmm. Then I don't feel gypped. I feel like he right. said he was going to tackle that verse, and every part of that verse he tackled. Yep. Um, and so for me, though, it typically is I want to cover everything in this so let's say i'm preaching a narrative i want to do justice to what is the setting why is it important but not you know not 20 minutes on the setting but but something like that you know and then you do know like this is a tricky verse or this is a textual variant and and i've got to say something because they got it right in their bibles yeah or verse verse 41 isn't there (laughs) Uh, someone's going to notice it um and so like even those kind of technical things, I want to make sure I'm I'm covering whatever whatever has been presented there in front of their eyes. Um, I, I've often I've heard a pastor once say, when you preach a sermon, you better make sure you address even if you simply say I'm not going to address this, this yeah. sermon, address the the main thing that someone with a study Bible would would say. Hey, this is the you know big thing I'm thinking about right yeah. now. Yeah, no, that's right. That, so that I try to cover all the material. So do good exegesis of the passage, um, expositional preaching, and then exalt Christ would be the other thing that comes to mind. And so, so what does that mean? I think that it sounds so lofty and good, but yeah. you know, what does that mean in practice in, in a sermon from, you know, Genesis or from Revelation? Yeah, I, I think probably the nicest note I ever got from someone was a young lady in one of my congregations, and it was a, a paragraph on this sort of theme of like, Every sermon, you're gonna like give us Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that. You know, that's the mm. gist of it. And I think what it means is like I'm going not only going to hermeneutically like take you to Jesus if I'm in Genesis or anywhere else, but I'm gonna I'm gonna express like how grateful I am for Jesus, mm. how how needy I am, and I'm thankful for, for what Jesus did, um, or how how Jesus fits into the flow of Scripture, and isn't this isn't this amazing, or isn't He amazing? I, I say a lot of things like that, like, isn't Jesus amazing? You ever stop and think about how amazing He is? You know, things mm-hmm. like that that really engage people and exalt people. And then I think to the flip side, the other question, and, and this goes a little bit with autobiography, is like, I don't want to be the hero. Jesus has to be the hero. And then I think I want people walking away understanding what the passage is about so not so much if it's like oh he's such a great preacher or or 
that illustration, like if you use a dog illustration, people come up to you afterwards like, I, I love that dog illustration. Yeah. You know, like preachers, the more and more you preach, you know, like people's soft spots, how you can get them. You can emotionally get them. Like I said, it can be dangerous telling your own story just to emotionally get them. But if you, I'm trying to tell a story about my life or something else that emotionally gets them and is related to the truth. Um, hmm. And so Jonathan Edwards, back to him, is a, you know, I want to, he has a, f- a phrase that I love for preaching. Like, my goal is to raise, to raise their affections as high as possible, provided they're raised by the truth. Um, and that's, that's the connection I want to make. So there's a lots of, yeah, tricks of the trade where you can get people to cry or you can get people um, thoroughly engaged and just think, oh, he's such a brilliant storyteller, you know, and that's, yeah. all, that's all they think as they walk out, like nothing about anybody, about Jesus or what on earth was the passage today? Who, who cares? You yeah. know, isn't our pastor so great? <laughs> Have you ever felt that temptation or, or maybe rewrite a sermon you've written and kind of recognized, you know, I... I I veered too much towards kind of stirring their emotions with this story or with this great illustration. And it's not really what I should be doing in this moment. Yeah. I don't, I don't struggle with um, the storytelling aspect. I feel like I'm careful for whatever reason. I also don't use stories as much as maybe other preachers do. I think what I struggle with is wit. Mm. <laughs> so I've got this sharp Irish wit. So I have a lot of little witty lines here and there, <laughs> which I think is used effectively, but I can also cross the line. Mm. Um, and I sort of know when I do, especially if it's a certain congregation, like someone, a group, like a group of college kids, you can do all sorts of witty things <laughs> you and do they're a like, lot. great. But older congregation, you could sense after you've crossed the line, like, mm, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Um, and I was doing it because I wanted to laugh. That's that's what my motive was. Um, and so I try to use wit. Not I do want to get a laugh because I want to I want to reengage people maybe. Yeah. Uh, or I just want to be myself. That's what came to mind, and that's why I put it in there. Yeah. What do you do when you feel discouraged by a sermon that you've preached? Like, say you you go up there on a Sunday morning, you give your sermon, you do your best, and then you step down, and immediately you're just like, that did not land the way I wanted it to land, and uh, on the drive home, you know, you ask your wife, hey, how did, how did that go? And she kind of gives this non-committed, uh, it's okay. Yeah. You know, so what, what would be your next step in that kind of situation? Yeah, never ask your wife on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> just, just avoid it. I have a very discerning wife, so there's always there's always something she could tell me. But uh, no, now I do ask my wife. But early on, honestly, I wouldn't ask her the, f- right away. That's some uh, of the hardest feedback. The people closest to you, Yeah, uh, that, that's the stuff that, maybe stings the most when it's not overwhelmingly positive. Right. Yeah. Or not here are all the positive things and here's two things you could have worked on mm. type of thing. And, and my wife's very good at the balance of, of that. Um, but you do want someone you trust, you know, listening to them. I, I would say discouragement. I can't think of a, uh, because I prepare a lot, but I, I can't think of a time where I felt like I was, I didn't get that text right at all. Like mm. it was just a disaster. Yeah. Um, or there have been times I've been nervous preaching, but I'll ask my wife afterwards and she said, I, I didn't tell, I couldn't tell you were nervous. So like, that's not a fun experience for me, Yeah. but I'm not, I'm not discouraged by that. If it didn't come across, like when you see someone who's nervous, you're, you're nervous for them. And it's yeah. just this, it's, everyone's it's an uncomfortable awkward. experience. And so if that wasn't happening, then I'm, I'm like, okay. But if that did happen, then I'd be like, oh boy, what, what was going on there? Um, I think uh, for me, it was more getting used to the first few sermons or year of preaching, um, feeling discouraged every time uh, mm. after a sermon because you always thought, oh, I could do better than that. That was one thing, or at least I thought. And then um, you, you thought, oh, people are going to really be engaged when I do this, and they're not. Or some people aren't, or people yawn all the time, you know. Like, <laughs> and Kent Hughes would talk about like, I knew that I knew that I had like people listening. There were no yawns. There were no noises, basically. Um, so he set that up uh, as the example for you. You're you're, you're shooting then for yeah, well, silence. Well, and well, I'm no saying yawns. there is, is is something about like silence. Like people aren't coughing. There's just like everybody's listening. Yeah. And so I think as a preacher, you want like every, everything I'm saying is like really great, isn't it? You know, so you should be listening to everything. Um, and so I think getting over that, like, no, some, sometimes people 
it's still hard though. Like I'm preaching a crossway or something. Someone takes out their cell phone. Cell phones are so hard today because I don't know if they're looking at the passage or they're responding to a text. But if I see them start typing, I'm like, they're responding to a text. And so <laughs> not to get thrown off yeah. by like, and it's easy to get thrown off by that kind of stuff. Um, is like just saying that's going to happen all the time. There's going to be ways you'll be discouraged. Um, and so I, more of my philosophy of preaching changed over over time. And I use the analogy of um, like feeding, I'm feeding a meal to you. And so some sermons are going to be like meat and potatoes, like really hearty, really, you know, a meal I'd want to <laughs> strengthen <laughs> me, give me good iron. Um and some are going to be like cornflakes, and mm. but both are going to feed you, and both, bo- both are going to sustain you, and you're going to grow taller, and you're going to get bigger, and you're, you know all these sort of things. I mm. think of it like I don't. Um, my mother fed me every day. I don't remember what she fed me. Yeah, but she fed me, and so you probably only remember a couple meals. Yeah, out of your whole life, really significant meals, right. perhaps. But yeah, and you may remember the terrible ones and, and the good ones typically. Yeah. But I think, and the same with preaching. Like if if I if I'm faithful to what the text is saying mm. and I've done my best for this given week, there may have been a lot of things that came up and I wasn't able to give it as much time as I want. That's fine. Like that's what in God's providence he gave me that week. So I'm feeding you something and you can determine what it is, um, what the quality <laughs> of the substance you're putting in your body is. Um, but some, and, and in God's providence, some people will really be fed. Some people will be saved, you know, with your worst sermon. Mm. Um, but if it's faithful to what the passage is saying, what God is saying in his word, then then you're good to go. And and I think it also, like, there's a lot of ego going on with preaching. And just to be like, I, I'm i an expert, like, in Ecclesiastes. Everything I say is going to be forgotten. And so I'll be forgotten. And that's good. That's fine. Because I don't. I don't remember sermons, the great sermons, like I remember parts of them, you know, mm. but I do remember that God used that sermon to um, get me closer to my wife or, you know, something, but I don't even remember the text it was, you know, that, yeah. so I think as long as you can think of that, like uh, in those sort of <laughs> maybe dark perspectives, but also mm. like that's reality is like there, uh, I just need to be feeding God's people weekly yeah, or whenever called upon. And that's my job, not like, oh, he was so memorable, um, mm. or isn't he great, or anything like that. Or wasn't that sermon amazing, and then I'm going to remember that forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not always the goal. That's not how God even works in our lives spiritually. Right. Well, Doug, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about preaching and that important calling that God has placed on uh, many men's lives. We appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Wonderful to talk with you. That was Doug O'Donnell on Common Questions About Preaching. For more, be sure to check out the book he co-authored with Leland Reikand entitled The Beauty and Power of Biblical Exposition, Preaching the Literary Artistry and Genres of the Bible. You can pick up a copy of the book for 30% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org plus. That's crossway.org plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. That helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.